there comes a point, right? You have Alzheimer's. So, a so the first question is, how is it actually diagnosed? How, how do we say he has this person has Alzheimer's? And then what? So what treatments are available once you have the forest fire? Sure, great question. Um, so right now, I like to say the elephant in the room <clears throat> is we don't diagnose Alzheimer's disease until the brain has degenerated to the point of dysfunction. It would be the equivalent of not diagnosing diabetes until you lost half of your beta cells in your pancreas. It'd be the equivalent of not diagnosing coronary artery disease until you need a bypass, coronary bypass. That's the problem. So we got to bring Alzheimer's up into this new, into the, up to where other diseases are, early detection, early intervention. See when the plaques and tangles are first forming, just like you look at cholesterol and heart disease, look at glucose and insulin. We need to do that for Alzheimer's. But right now we don't. So what can we do about it? So by the time someone has the earliest, earliest stages of mild cognitive impairment, their brain is already, if it's due to Alzheimer's, their brain is already full of plaque, full of plaque. And there are tangles. And there's already enough neuroinflammation that synapses are starting to go and nerve cells are dying and you're getting the cognitive problems. And a lot of people say, well, how about senile moments, you know, senior moments versus, you know, Alzheimer's disease. And I, I like to say, well, you got to think about, you know, when you can't remember something, is it because you're too busy? Is it because your bandwidth is too? Is it because you're apathetic? Is it because you don't care? Is it because you didn't pay attention? Or is it because you can't really get there? And at what point does that lapse in memory start affecting your lifestyle, start affecting your quality of life? That's when you worry it might be the earliest stages of Alzheimer's. Um, there is an app that I helped develop called BrainGuide.org. Um, developed by a foundation called Us Against Alzheimer's Disease. BrainGuy.org is, is something where you can go by yourself privately on your computer, on your phone app. You can even call a phone number with a computerized voice. No one's going to know, right? Because there's a stigma to this that people you have to deal with. But people don't want to talk about Alzheimer's with their doctor. Doctors don't want to talk about Alzheimer's. There's still a stigma, just like when I was growing up in the 60s, we used to call cancer the C word. You know, people don't want to talk about it. So there's an app where you can actually go, I think it's mybrainguide.org, mybrainguide.org. And you can answer some questions. And at the end of that test, which nobody will see but you, you can even answer them for your spouse. You can do it for your spouse or loved one instead of yourself. It will say, yeah, you might want to see a doc or no, I wouldn't worry about it. Or yeah, you should go see a neurologist. And in your area, here are, here are the docs in your area you might want to see. So it's the first time something like this was done. And then you would go for your neuropsych exam and the doc would say, yeah, or no, you know, you're in the earliest stages of this disease. Um, now at that point, trying to blow up that match of amyloid, well, the matches are lit. Trying to, it might help a little bit. I mean, you know, but one of those biogen trials with removing amyloid had a bit of cognitive benefit. It could help a little bit. Um, trying to get rid of the tangles. Well, the brush fires already set the forest fires. That might help, but it's not enough. You got to do two, one of two things. Put out that forest fire of neuroinflammation. Same thing we do with COVID, right? I mean, COVID, think about COVID. The virus doesn't kill you. COVID causes inflammation in the lungs and blood vessels and arteries where you get cytokine storm, as we've heard this term, cytokine storm. Cytokines are the mediators of inflammation. Same thing in the brain. In the brain, plaques and tangles are driving inflammation instead of COVID virus. And you get and this inflammation that causes the, the, the major cell death. So we are working, many are working. It wasn't until we described the first neuroinflammation Alzheimer genes, we didn't have targets until then. We found the first one, CD33, which you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. The second one was found um, by a group led by John Hardy, who's in London, and also at the same time by a company in Iceland called Decode. And that second uh, uh, neuroinflammation Alzheimer's gene was TREM2, T-R-E-M2. <clears throat> and it turns out they're an on switch and off switch. CD33 tells the microglial cells, stop cleaning amyloid and housekeeping, kill everything in sight. TREM2 says, no, keep cleaning, stay a housekeeper, take off that take off that uniform, you're not a soldier. So they are the opposing forces. So the, the little microglial cell can decide, am I gonna clean amyloid tonight while you sleep? 
or am I going to put on my soldier, my SWAT gear, and I'm going to wipe out everything in sight? Those are the two main proteins and that, that control that. Um, and now we're, we're trying to develop therapies to turn off CD33, mm-hmm. that's the on switch, or turn on TREM2, right? And that's happening because of, because of genetics. Um, in the meantime, and we don't have anything for that yet. And my lab, we, we invented in my lab, Alzheimer's in a dish, mini human brain organoids made from stem cells, where we recapitulate that whole pathway from plaques to tangles to neuroinflammation in one month. In a, in a paper punch sized mini brain and a index card sized tray with 96 wells in it. And each one is a mini brain. And each one's we can screen drugs, approved drugs, natural products, which one stop the plaques, which one stop the tangles, which one stop the neuroinflammation. Um, and we have a whole slew of them and we're going to put them into trials now because these are safe compounds. In the meantime, one of the first successes from that type of screen came from a company I started um, seven, eight years ago with two kids from Brown University. And they were kids, they were undergraduates. One was a senior, one just graduated. Um, They were both in a fraternity called Sigma Chi. I was a member when I was in in college. I took the meeting with them. Um, One of them graduated from the same uh, secondary school my daughter goes to. So I took the meeting and they had a very simple idea. They said, if you want to protect nerve cells from dying, from neuroinflammation, this should be helpful in any disease. Yeah, obviously. But it's Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, there's different ways to get the initial cell death, Lewy bodies and Parkinson's and amyloid and Alzheimer's. But at the end of the day, you have to turn on neuroinflammation to get that exponentially more cell death to get the symptoms. So they said, we want to figure out a way to protect nerve cells from neuroinflammation across different neurodegenerative diseases. And they focused on what's called oxidative damage, oxidative stress. The other way these, so the, the, the other way these little glial cells wipe out the, that, the brain when there's cell death, and there was that, that response to say, we have to wipe this area out because they think it's infected, right? Because nerve cells were dying. Instead of eating the nerve cells and engulfing them or eating the axons and synapses, they shoot out free radicals, right? Hydroxyl radicals, oxygen-based radicals, nitric oxide-based radicals that permeate the nerve cells, go to the mitochondria, which is the energy center, and wipe it out. So now that the nerve cell can't get energy and it commits suicide. The nerve cells are programmed. To, to take themselves out if they can't do their job. It's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. So there's two ways that se- nerve cells can do that. The, if the mitochondria, the energy center is not working right, it says, okay, die. The other way is where you make proteins, where the proteins get processed and manufactured in a part of the cell that we abbreviate the ER. Um, and if the proteins can't get processed right, because that takes a lot of energy, that's another switch where the nerve cell says, okay, I'm committing suicide. I'm taking myself out. So with these two kids from Brown University, we developed one drug that protects the mitochondria. So you don't die from that. And a second drug that protects where the proteins are getting made. The ER stands for endoplasmic reticulum, if you remember your cell biology from school. And, you com- and then the idea was you need both the drugs to protect the nerve cells. One is not enough. He said, only having the mitochondria is like half of a bulletproof vest. The free radicals, the oxygen-based hydroxyl radicals, et cetera, are like bullets. And if you only protect the mitochondria, they can take you out at the ER. If you only have the ER protected, they can take you out at the mitochondria. You need the full vest, bulletproof vest. That's the acronym. Anyway, we, def- we, we came up with two drugs. Um, I had them do a test that was guaranteed to fail, right? I wanted to show them how science is done. I said, in science, your only job is to disprove your hypothesis. So you set up an experiment that's, that should fail and then, you, and then you can be delighted if it didn't and then you take the next step. So we took nerve cells, we took the, the, the human neurons, nerve cells in a dish, dish model and you pour on them hydrogen peroxide. Mm-hmm. And hydrogen peroxide is like neuroinflammation and free radical damage times a billion, right? Everything dies. 
with hydrogen peroxide when you're a nerve cell. And then you say, let's see if these two drugs can protect and save any, save any of them from dying. So they did the experiment and each drug alone didn't do much, half a bulletproof vest, but the two drugs together saved 90% of the nerve cells from hydrogen peroxide. I said, guys, this is impossible. You know, don't fool around, go do it again. I don't believe, you know, they did it again, 95%. Like, man, we got something here. So we said, let's go for ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease first, because you can do a smaller trial. The disease progresses faster. You can get your, you can see the results faster. It's a devastating disease. Bottom line is we did an ALS trial with our Healy Center at Mass General. My, my chief ran the trial. It worked. The trial passed muster. It got published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the top clinical journal in the world, or one of them with, with Lancet. And, um, and then, um, and now next thing you know, with this little company, Amelix that we started, we're looking at, um, uh, right now we're waiting for approval, uh, from the FDA, Canada and, uh, EU. And, um, and we don't know what's going to happen yet, but the indications are that we, that we have a good chance of having the, the, the third approved drugs for ALS. Uh, based on protecting nerve cells from neuroinflammation. And now we're trying to get an Alzheimer's disease. We'll try it in Parkinson's and see if it works, ask if it works across the board. So that was the first success in a trial where you're protecting, you're not necessarily stopping neuroinflammation, but you're protecting nerve, cell, nerve cells from dying. And actually in doing so, you tamp down neuroinflammation because there's a vicious cycle where dying neurons trigger neuroinflammation right? As neuroinflammation kills neurons, those dying neurons trigger more neuroinflammation. So if you protect the nerve cells from dying, you can also do indirectly tamp down and, and start to curb the neuroinflammation and you save the cells. So we had a successful ALS trial. We're doing a bigger trial now, phase three, and we're waiting to see if we get approval and we're going to try it in Alzheimer's. And it just shows what can happen when you have uh, models that involve actual human nerve cells in mini brains that better mimic the brain rather than trying to do it in mice, which are very different from humans. 